The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Last night was the first of many 2020 Democratic primaries in Iowa. It is, in fact, a caucus system. So much anticipation. Finally, the 2020 Democratic primary gets going. Finally, we are going to have some information and data and numbers about it is not just polls. It is now voting who takes the first win. And unfortunately, it has turned into a worldwide embarrassment. Headlines around the world embarrassing for the Democratic Party as multiple systems apparently fell apart. Results simply stopped being published after one or two percent of the vote was out. Almost every aspect of this has been a cartoonish train wreck. And as of this recording, we do not know who won yesterday. Uh, we were streaming live yesterday. A beautiful live stream. We had uh, six uh, or six thousand or so people watching the entire evening. Uh, it got to be nine thirty p.m. Eastern, and we had just a few results. It got to be ten p.m. Eastern, ten thirty p.m. Eastern, and we got a little bit more. Eleven p.m. Nothing, and eventually, just past eleven thirty p.m. Eastern time on our stream, we realized from looking at what various DNC officials were putting out on Twitter that the results were unlikely to come out last night. And uh, that was it for us for the night. And as of this morning, we still do not know who won yesterday's Iowa caucus. Now, it is normal that it can take a little while once you have the final vote to get the final numbers for what are called state delegate equivalents. But we are talking about we don't even have the final vote, which is a preliminary number used to sort of get an estimate of what the state devil state delegate equivalents are ultimately going to be. Now, the explanations that were being uh, provided have shifted. The first explanation was that the results were delayed because the DNC is running them through quality control. That was already probably the wrong lie to tell if it indeed was a lie, because that was interpreted by some as we don't like the results and thus we are delaying and seeing what we can do to maybe change the results or wait for results that the DNC is happier with to come in so that they can release them all at once. And the where a lot of people's minds went was this is meant to hurt Bernie in some way, shape or form. But it actually doesn't appear to be the case. It appears that that was merely a cover. Again, this is what we believe as of right now. It appears that the quality control talking point was a cover for what was a total breakdown and failure of a, a technological system, an IT Internet based app software system that was used to tally and report the results of the Iowa caucus. By the time you hear this, by the time you watch today's show, you may know the results. You may have a clearer explanation as to what exactly happened last night. The DNC is saying that the results are going to be released sometime today. Now, in the wake of this, multiple candidates have claimed to either have internal numbers showing that they won or gave speeches, making it sound like they won. In fact, Amy Klobuchar did something hilarious last night at around 1115. I think it was 11, 1115 p.m. Eastern time. We had no results. Amy Klobuchar was in like fourth or fifth place based on like two percent of the vote at that time. She came out and gave a speech that seemed like a victory speech, even though she hadn't. She certainly wasn't in the lead. And it's uh, she certainly hadn't. Uh, uh, we didn't have enough information to know whether anyone had won. She kind of gave a victory speech, which in a way was genius because nothing was going on. Everything was stopped and a whole bunch of networks ended up covering the Klobuchar speech, even though she was like in fourth or fifth place with about 10 percent of the vote at the time. Then you had Pete Buttigieg. He uh, Pete Buttigieg was the, was the early leader yesterday. He put out a statement kind of like implying he won. He says, Iowa, you have shocked the nation. <laughs> uh, I guess the real shock was how incompetent the process was. But Pete Buttigieg, with his comment, suggesting, I guess, that it was shocking that he was doing so well, at least in the early numbers. Then Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders says that uh, Bernie has his own internal polling saying he got 29 percent of the vote. Buttigieg, 24 percent. Warren, 21 with Joe Biden in a distant fourth at 12 percent. And we'll talk about the Biden thing in a second. This is all now being compounded by the claim 
that the unreleased Des Moines Register poll from the weekend had these results, which were Bernie first, Biden fourth. Yesterday, I told you that over the weekend, the Des Moines Register decided not to release their last poll before voting because of a claim that had been made that someone who was interviewed for the poll said when they asked me the question about who I support and they read me the list of candidates, they didn't read every candidate. And that, of course, is a really big deal when you were doing polling. So the Des Moines Register on that basis said they were canceling the release of the poll that, however, uh, uh, the the claim now is from 538 that it was in that unreleased poll, Bernie 22, Warren 18, boot edge edge 16 and Biden 13. And that is very similar to what Bernie's internal polling is showing. If these results or some version of them are accurate, this is a potential game changer for Joe Biden. Joe Biden, in a sense, had the most to lose last night because as the longtime presumptive front runner, even though he was polling a, a, a close second in Iowa going in yesterday, if Biden ends up with half of the support that polling showed, this is extraordinarily damaging to Joe Biden. And if that's the case, I wouldn't be surprised to see the DNC establishment rapidly shift likely to Pete Buttigieg. edge. You would think maybe they would go to Klobuchar, but Klobuchar did even worse than Joe Biden yesterday based just on those early results that we had. We'll see what the final numbers show. And that could be a disaster for Joe Biden. But then if you zoom out a little bit and this is really the tragedy, this is a fiasco that plays directly into Donald Trump's hands, who immediately started making fun of the whole process on Twitter to great effect. And why wouldn't he? The process became a complete and total farce. Trump tweeting about how a coin toss is used to decide who gets a last delegate within a particular precinct. And that's true. That's part of the process. Check out this video of a coin toss happening yesterday. What you're watching right And then flip it over. Heads. In the end, these single delegates decided by a coin toss make very little difference, but it looks really silly when people are voting and then you flip a coin. It's crazy. Trump then tweeting, quote, the Democrat caucus is an unmitigated disaster. Nothing works just like they ran the country. Remember the five billion dollar Obamacare website that should have cost two percent of that. The only person that can claim a very big victory in Iowa last night is Trump. And you know what, guys? He's right. Unfortunately, this gives a ton of visibility for their keep government out of stuff ideology. Now, in reality, the issue here is the DNC, not the government, but it doesn't matter. And case in point, Trump retweeting a guy I know, a uh, guy Benson, who posted no, but seriously, re let us run your health care, they said. Now, it, it's a complete wrong reaction to last night's fiasco. The DNC wouldn't be running health care, but still, this stuff works. The fiasco plays directly into everything that they are arguing and have been doing for years at this point in time. And the way in which this might again mess up the credibility of the entire primary process is raining once again. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Imagine that Joe Biden is uh, expecting to come in first or second based on the polling, and he ends up fourth or fifth, as he might end up based on the early results we have. After this fiasco, with a delay for quality control, followed by we just don't have any results, we'll get them to you hopefully sometime tomorrow. If you're Joe Biden, you were polling first, second, and you want and you end up coming in fourth, fifth, you immediately say, I don't believe these results. I don't believe these results can be trusted. And you either say foul play or just errors or whatever the case may be. And then you immediately have a disastrous situation where the presumptive front runner, at least for a long time, right, is publicly saying, I don't trust our own results in this primary caucus. It's a disaster. It's an unmi to quote Trump. It is an unmitigated disaster for Democrats. It will further divide Democrats. It will help Donald Trump even more. It's truly sickening and it allows Trump and the right. It allows anyone who wants to make the case that Democrats are incapable of governing 
to make it on the basis that they can't even get a caucus right now. I know that in the end there will probably be explanations that go back to, you know, it was whoever the technology was outsourced to that dropped the ball and they're offering a refund for what they charge to make this app. It doesn't matter. What matters is story and narrative. And that is the story right now. I'm curious whether tonight Donald Trump will take advantage of this fiasco in the State of the Union speech, which we will carry live on YouTube, Twitch and Facebook starting at 830. The speech is at 9 p.m. Join me early at 830 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I hope you'll join. I have published tonight's State of the Union bingo card to my Twitter page at D Pacman. You can download it and play along. We'll see who uh, who ends up with bingo tonight. Let's talk about John Bolton briefly. There are multiple new reports out that Donald Trump is keeping a list of people who crossed him during his presidency, who he would like to get locked up eventually. And his own former national security adviser, John Bolton, is reportedly on that list. We heard this from Rick Wilson. We've had Rick on the show, longtime Republican strategist. He's an anti Trump Republican. He says that Donald Trump is likely to start putting pressure on the Justice Department to try to get revenge on people like Bolton. Bolton, of course, recently saying uh, that in his upcoming book in the manuscript portion that was released, says that Donald Trump personally told him withhold the Ukraine aid until Ukraine smears Joe Biden publicly. Of course, the Senate is expected to vote to acquit Donald Trump tomorrow, Wednesday in the Senate. Rick Wilson says that John Bolton has one choice right now and that John Bolton must leak the full manuscript of the book today. The reason Wilson says this is that if Bolton doesn't leak the full transcript with additional context and assertions related to what Trump told him about Ukraine, Trump gets acquitted tomorrow and then ruins Bolton's life. Wilson says Bolton's only shot is to try to get the full story out today of what he saw Trump do, get it into the public before the Senate votes to make the vote look like a sham kangaroo court vote, which of course is exactly what that vote will be. Investigative reporter Gabriel Sherman says it's not just Bolton on Trump's enemies list. It's Republicans and Democrats. Adam Schiff is on Trump's list. Jerry Nadler is on Trump's list list. Even Republican Senator Mitt Romney from Utah is reportedly on that list. I can imagine this list of enemies written in crayon on a napkin from Kentucky Fried Chicken that Trump was eating on Air Force One. But it doesn't matter because this is a dystopian reality. Uh, Sherman reports that he was told Trump wants John Bolton criminally investigated. Uh, one possibility would be for the mishandling of classified information that Trump seems to think John Bolton was engaged in, which is truly, even if true, call uh, the pot, pot calling the kettle black when you were Donald Trump talking about mishandling sensitive information. There's another report that Trump wants to leak emails showing that Bolton was doing pay to play while on the National Security Council. That's been denied by people close to Bolton. If this happens, the transition to full blown authoritarian dictatorship will be complete. The attempted jailing of former elected officials and of uh, uh, administration officials on trumped up charges as directed by the president. Now, this is a good opportunity to clarify something. We need elected officials held more accountable than they are held. I have no problem with elected officials, current and former, being investigated as part of a fair judicial process. We lack that. We have this de facto immunity that so many of our elected officials and our elites have merely because they are in a position of power. But you don't do it by having the president make a list of enemies that wants uh, that he wants revenge on and then forcing the Justice Department to investigate them. Uh, this is exactly why, though, I'm saying there have been no consequences for Donald Trump's actions. So why wouldn't he do this? Russia probe, possible cognitive decline, hush money payments, campaign finance violations, hiding his taxes, emoluments violations. And he's fine. He's continuing to be president. He's making the U.S. a laughing stock. Why wouldn't he be emboldened by that and say, hey, let me make a list of enemies and I'll try to get them jailed sometime soon because he's gotten away with everything so far. And unless we vote him out on November 3rd, he will likely succeed at triggering at least some investigation of his political enemies. He will get away with all of it. As far as John Bolton, I hope it's clear to him. He has one choice. It's not even really a choice when there's only one. He has to spill the beans, period. As far as Lev Parnas, I hope he publishes everything he has, including every video 
he has access to. But in the meantime, this authoritarian nightmare has to be stopped one way or the other. And there's really no the other right now. The one way is vote him out overwhelmingly on November 3rd because nothing else is having any effect. Let me know what you think. I'm on Twitter at D Pacman. Make sure you're following me there. The David Pacman Show at davidpacman.com. The David Pacman Show at davidpacman.com. All right, today's new members of the day are Brian Smith and Tommy Bush. I was in a band with Tommy in Brooklyn when I lived there. So great uh, to see both of these names as today's new members of the day. Also want to say thanks to today's longtime sustaining member of the day, Frank Traficant, who has been with us almost five years. Join up today. It's cheap. It's easy. It feels good, man. Uh, Join Pacman.com. I have to tell you, Michael Bloomberg is doing something absolutely hilarious because it shows how easily triggerable Donald Trump is. Michael Bloomberg is trolling Donald Trump about his weight. Remember that this is something Trump is very triggerable about. Uh, by all serious accounts, Donald Trump is clinically obese. Now, he officially claims to be six foot three inches tall and weigh two hundred and thirty nine pounds. If true, that puts him like a pound below clinically obese. But nobody believes that height. Trump is pictured in, uh, ne- in in a number of pictures. He's standing next to people known to be shorter than six, three. And Trump is very clearly shorter than them. So we know this is a very sensitive topic for Donald Trump, the alpha male. This is an ad that Michael Bloomberg put together where he specifically uses what are known as fat pics of Donald Trump playing golf. Now, I'm not calling them fat pics pejoratively. These are specific pictures of Donald Trump playing golf in like an all white, uh, very light khakis and a white shirt where he is known to be absolutely furious when these pictures are used because, okay, he looks extremely large in them and Trump doesn't like looking this way. Check it out. It even includes a picture of Trump looking visibly exhausted and sort of climbing to reach what looks like an errant golf ball that he shot uh, off the course. Take a look. People have said when you were mayor, the city gave Trump a contract to operate a golf course. Yes, that's true. But he was the only bidder and running a golf course is the only job that I would hire him for. I'm Mike Bloomberg and I approve this message. It is now being reported by Charlie Gasparino, no left wing bomb thrower. He's a reporter for Fox Fox Business Network that the Bloomberg ads with the so-called fat picks have made Trump furious and that he's been melting down privately and also tweeting endlessly about Michael Bloomberg, who he has dubbed mini Mike Trump tweeting in close succession, quote, mini Mike is part of the fake news. They are all working together. In fact, Bloomberg isn't covering himself too boring to do or other Dems only Trump. That sounds fair. It's all the fake news media, and that's why nobody believes in them anymore. Continuing to focus on mini Mike saying, quote, many of the ads you are watching were paid for by mini Mike Bloomberg. He is going nowhere, just wasting his money. But he is getting the DNC to rig the election against crazy Bernie, something they wouldn't do for Cory Booker and others. They are going to do it again to Bernie 2016. And then once again, and this one is actually hilarious. Trump tweeting so triggered. Mini Mike is now negotiating both to get on the Democrat primary (laughs) debate stage and to have the right to stand on boxes or a lift during the debates. This is sometimes done, (laughs) but not really fair. That is absolutely hilarious. The stuff Trump comes up with when he gets triggered is so funny. He also did something Trump did that he rarely does, if ever, which is he tweeted about exercising. Now, remember, Donald Trump is the guy who believes that when the human body exercises, it depletes some total amount of energy that you have at your disposal for life. And uh, so he's not a guy who brags about exercising. And yet after the fat pick ad came out, Donald Trump uh, tweeting a picture of himself golfing with a caption, getting a little exercise this morning. So regardless of Bloomberg's chances and the chances aren't great, although I do believe it's possible Mike Bloomberg could end up third in delegates one if he continues the strategy that we've outlined a couple of weeks ago. This is just fantastic. I would love to see Bloomberg also do some ads that are 
compilations of Trump's slurred speech, you know, the United States of America, uh, God bless the USA, the Israeli city of Jerusalem and that that type of thing. Whoever is doing these knows exactly what the trigger points are for Donald Trump and is exploiting them. I saw that the Bloomberg campaign is hiring uh, some data science people here in Massachusetts, probably another Super Tuesday states as well. Clearly, Bloomberg is not being shy about laying out the cash and we can expect a lot of action from Bloomberg. I just hope there's more of these ads that are triggering Trump visibly on Twitter. Last thing to clarify. I'm not making fun of obesity, nor do I find it funny. It's a serious medical condition. What I'm pointing out is that the supposed alpha male Trump, who's the best at everything, both eats a terrible diet, doesn't exercise and is so easily triggerable when you hit certain pressure points. And Michael Bloomberg is taking advantage of those. OK, I've been thinking about whether or not to do this story. And it just has to be done. All right. Joe Biden is really weird about touching voters. I'm not talking about the creepy Uncle Joe stuff related to women. OK, I'm talking about something totally different here. I'm talking about how Joe Biden gets very strange in even remotely contentious conversations with men who ask him questions on the campaign trail. Now, I'm going to show you two videos of this normal caveat. If Biden's the nominee, I'm voting for Biden. This is not about anything other than this is strange. I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't point this out since I point out strange behavior by other candidates. I talked about this in a recent live stream and I pointed out Joe's behavior is oddly aggressive towards voters. And some people immediately said, David, Joe's not aggressive. You're just a beta male and you're uncomfortable with confrontation. First of all, this has nothing to do with me. And I encourage you to look at these videos. If you're listening to the podcast or on the radio, find the visual component we're going to play. And tell me this is normal behavior. If you normally behave this way with people around you in your real real life, I want to follow you around and see who you're hanging out with, because how Joe Biden behaves in these clips with voters is not normal. Let's look at the first one from Iowa. Here, Biden was asked about committing to phase out fossil fuels. And look at how Joe Biden starts poking this guy in the chest and getting aggressive with him. This is not normal. And as we look at the clip again, this time without audio, you see that the guy he's talking to has this sort of uncomfortable smile on his face because he recognizes Joe Biden's behavior is abnormal. Joe Biden's staffer or handler there. That's a voice we've gotten to know well on the campaign trail as she's often trying to get people to move on and get Joe Biden away from people. She starts saying, move on, you know, get get a get a move on when Joe Biden starts getting irritated with the voter. Here's another example of this. This one was when Biden was asked about some of his views on fossil fuels. This was at a Biden event and a guy showed up. The guy had critical questions, tough questions, but they are reasonable questions. And again, Biden gets in the guy's face, gets really close to the guy, starts poking the guy in the chest, eventually um, uh, tells the guy, find someone else to vote for, go vote for someone else. And you again hear that same handler say, thank you so much, trying to end it. But Biden just insists on talking and pokes the guy and then kind of holds on to the guy's open coat. Strange behavior. Take a look. But then you want to replace these gas lines. That's not going to work. We, keep, we, we got to stop building and replacing pipelines. We'll go vote for someone else. All right. Thanks so much, have sir. You guys, we're going to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to vote you in the general if you treat me. Yeah, right. I know. Well, <laughs> well, can I have a, can I have a Look, you you you're asking a picture of me. You're coming up and tell me you don't support me. No, no, no. My plant. Yeah, you did. You said you I said I would support you in the general. In the general. I'm right. looking for a primary. We're happy to get a member. That's what I'm looking for, okay? Just because we're trying to get it. You believe that Bernie can do something by 2030. I'm actually supporting Tom Steyer. Well, that's good. He's the right. guy that did Thanks more so much. We have a long line right here. Right the entire country okay. This is not about would I vote for Biden over Trump? Of course, I would vote for Biden over Trump. This is not about anything other than something about the gleam in Joe Biden's eye when he starts poking voters and treating them like this is extremely odd. And again, to people who saw me talk about this briefly on stream and said, David, you're a beta. This is not aggressive behavior. This is how men interact when they have conversations. 
Are you telling me this is how you are interacting with people in your everyday life? People, you know, friends, family, coworkers. I don't have anyone around me who number one treats people this way or number two would allow themselves to be treated this way. So if you watch these videos and this strikes you as the normal interactions of adults who are talking, I want to hear from you because maybe it's me in you know my sissy liberal northeastern city, as many of our viewers like to say. But this is not normal behavior that I've observed between adults anywhere. This is the type of behavior I see between drunk adults on the Las Vegas Strip shortly before they get into a fist fight. Right. That's what it uh, reminds me of. Let me know what you think. We'll have a couple of these clips on our Instagram page at David Pakman show. While you're there, follow me on Instagram at David Pakman as well. The David Pakman show at David Welcome back to the David Pakman show. It is great to have back with us today. Rob Larson, who's a professor of economics and also author of the book Bit Tyrants, the political economy of Silicon Valley. Uh, Rob, great to have you on. Thanks, Dave. Great to be here. So when I was on the Joe Rogan program a few months ago, we had this exchange where he started talking about how, of course, a company like Google is a liberal company. And it was an interesting conversation because it seemed that what he was talking about was, you know, does Google have a policy about anti trans bullying and that type of thing? And I pointed out, listen, Google is a company that is advocating for less regulation, is advocating for at a financial level against some of the uh, antitrust uh, um, uh, interests that the people may have and may want to have exercised through their government. And so if they, you know, have an internal policy where you can't misgender people, that's not really making them a liberal company. When you consider the sort of broader circumstances of where they are in the world of regulation and not paying taxes and so on and so forth, what is the right way that we should sort of think about the political orientation of these big tech companies that often have a sort of progressive ish seeming public side, but behind the scenes are really very similar to, you know, an oil company or whatever else the case may be. Yeah, right on. Well, that's, you know, very true. These companies definitely do affect a very, you know, woke, very pro diversity sort of public posture. But to me, I think based on my research, the right way to sort of frame this issue is to look at it from the point of view of what the company wants and then what like the workforce wants. And if you sort of dig into it, a lot of the time when people talk about how these companies are liberal and they're so on the left, it sounds goofy because these are, after all, publicly traded corporations whose stock is held by the wealthier households of our society and big financial institutions. How could they be leftist and anti-capitalist? I think a lot of the confusion is people look at what yeah the workforce is saying and then impute that to the company like well the company must be liberal then but of course as we've seen just in the last several months we've had a couple of fairly significant labor actions against Google where the workforce various components of its enormous workforce are doing walkouts and going on small strikes and doing independent organizing and just lately i mean i think maybe the ultimate uh rebuttal to claims these companies are liberal is just lately Google has been retaining like the same classic union busting, you know, anti-labor organization law firms that Walmart and Microsoft have been hiring for years, you know. And especially too, when you look at the interface with public policy in the face of all these new investigations that big tech, including Google, are subject to what they call the tech lash, you know. So could the congressional investigations, the uh, FTC and Justice Department approach Robes and the state attorneys general uh, as well. Google is now one of the biggest lobbying firms in Washington, spending many million a year, more than all of its tech peers, more than Amazon even, uh, on lobbying the government. And of course, they play a big role in election financing, both directly and through their PACs. So to me, uh, what I would just suggest to folks like Mr. Rogan is it's really worth taking a small amount of time to differentiate between what the labor force is pushing for and what the company wants. And then, yes, like policies that are, say, you know, for example, diversity oriented for a richer representative staff as in like you know, protecting the rights of uh, trans workers versus like the real money aspect 
uh, of the equation, which the firms are most interested in, all the lobbying and maintenance of their monopoly. And Google got the FTC to just stop investigating investigating it during the Obama years. Like that's where these bodies are buried. <laughs> One of the um, big differences between tech companies and a lot of other companies is that there's often some kind of almost like a fairy tale, a romanticized story about the origins of the company. You know, Mark Zuckerberg invented it in, in his in his uh, Harvard dorm room, invented Facebook. Jeff Bezos was in some job he hated and, you know, had the idea to start Amazon and whatever else. You don't see that with a lot of other types of companies that many of us interact with regularly, whether they be car companies, um, you know, airline companies or whatever the case may be. I'm curious whether part of that is because a lot of those other companies have just been around much longer. So the story of their creation seems less relevant because it's further away. Or mm. is there something more? Has there been a concerted effort to keep the mystique through these sort of fairy tale origin stories? Yeah, uh, you know, that's a great question. I think, yeah, pretty much those are the two dynamics. If you look at all of our great blue chip Fortune 500 companies, including your classic old company giants, you know, like GM and so on, uh, or Ford, uh, you know, IBM, they all have this very folksy, yes, small business. I developed this company in my mom's basement in the depression sort of origin mystique. It's true. Uh, these companies are all much younger, of course. Uh, you know, several of them are only you know, 10, 20 years old. So their origin story is more recent and therefore more foregrounded. But also uh, just because of the information based nature of these products, there's a little bit more of a but how did you get the great idea for this company? Because since they're information based, the idea for their platforms and for their services is kind of more of the core of the whole business than it is if you're manufacturing light bulbs and stuff. So it's true, like there really is that small business started in a garage mystique. But of course, as I look at in uh, one of the chapters of the book, uh, the firms vary, of course, but very typically their origins in terms of their technology comes straight from the public sector. So Google, again, is a classic case. People talk about, you know, Sergey and Page, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. They had the idea to start the firm and it's this great idea and they've built all these great businesses since. I just want to remind people Google's original web address wasn't Google.com. It was Google.stanford.edu because mm. they developed that at you know, Stanford uh, you know, Research Labs in their uh, computer science program, one of the great publicly funded research university campuses in the United States where you've got stable funding and you are allowed to indulge your intellectual curiosity and think freely about what would make a good search engine or what would make a good you know, social networking system. In the marketplace, you're under near-term pressure for profitability to get your stock price up and keep Wall Street happy with you. In the academic world, you're free to take your time. And of course, the internet itself, after all, was originally developed by uh, DARPA, you know, the Pentagon's research arm, along with the university system. And in the book, I just go through you know, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and the internet, and the hardware itself, like the stuff in your smartphone, you know, almost all of that technology comes from one or another public sector research institution, or at least through heavy public funding, which again, and insulates you from that short term market pressure. So to me, the story of the origins of these firms is one of the juiciest phony aspects about them. <laughs> well, so to stick with that a little bit, can you talk a little bit about what sort of regulatory or financial incentives also existed that allowed these companies to do what they did and to grow uh, as quickly as they did? I mean, certainly at a base level, people increasingly dependent on the Internet and more and more of day to day society being run through the Internet is a huge boon to a company that exists on mobile phones and on the Internet for sure. But in terms of regulation, tax breaks, et cetera, what else was done that allowed these companies to grow so quickly at the start? For sure. Well, the very um, loose regulatory framework is an important part of this story. Uh, all through the era when the internet and internet-based services were becoming more popularized, like in the, I'm old enough to remember in the 90s, uh, when the internet came to town and you could go to some library campuses and look up other card catalogs. Uh, like the, at that time, it was a bipartisan um, view that what you don't want to do is regulate the internet or online industries because that's going to impose new costs on them or limit their you know their innovation and their creativity and for the longest time like well through the bush years into into the obama years that was something that was more or less bipartisan we don't want to regulate the net it's growing it's giving us all these fun free services and so on 
Now, of course, as these firms have become so important, and as you say, as we're so reliant on them, and we start seeing their power in elections, in our society, in the way that we deal with everything through our phones, people are a lot more interested in putting some leashes on their behavior and on their power. But to me, the real issue with having had such a loose regulatory framework for so long for big tech is what I talk about in the first chapter of the book. These are markets that are subject to what we call network effects in economics. And network effect is just something that applies to certain markets where an information-based product is at play. And the big thing there is that uh, with those sort of markets, the service gains value the more people use it. So like a telephone, you know, as more people get on the phone network, your telephone gets a little bit more valuable to you because there's more and more people you can potentially call. Well, the same network effects apply to companies like Facebook. You want to be on the network that has all your friends on it, not on the one that has no one on it. And Google search even, as more people do Google searches day in and day out, their algorithms keep learning from that. And the more search searches that are done, the stronger their algorithm and search processes become. So the thing about network effects is they're a strong incentive that leads to monopolization or maybe having two or three very dominant firms in a market. And that is what we see in big tech from Facebook's and Instagram's, you know, oligopoly to, you know, Google's mobile search monopoly to YouTube. There's a long list, but it's all these straight economic aspects to it. So there was a big deal made when Amazon, uh, basically after being shamed by Bernie Sanders, decided that they were going to start paying everybody 15 bucks an hour. And the end result, I thought, was great. Of course, uh, it was a calculation for Amazon that there was going to be a PR benefit more than likely that in the long term would exceed the additional cost to them of paying the 15 bucks an hour. But let's ignore that for a second. Let's imagine that it worked in that an elected official shamed a company and they made the right decision. When Donald Trump, between being elected and inaugurated, went to, I believe it was Indiana or Iowa, Indiana, and announced that he struck a deal with carrier air conditioner that they were going to keep their factory open in Indiana. And what he basically did was just give him money, right? There was a plan where carrier decided we're leaving and Trump came in and said, hey, here's some money if you stay. My criticism at the time was this is not a scalable economic policy. This is saying, mm. hey, I found a company that has already made a business decision. I'm changing the calculus by giving them some cash. And of course, in the end, that money was used to uh, start automating away those jobs. Anyway, half of the workforce still went to Mexico. It was a disaster. There's not that much of a difference in a sense between Trump giving money to carrier to get them to stay and Bernie pressuring one company to pay 15 bucks an hour. Now, of course, the the one that Bernie did is working out much better in terms of his result, its results. But my question is about the scalability of policy when it comes to these things. We can't really be relying on elected officials to be making one off deals, can we? I mean, it seems to me that we need something systemic to be done about regulation, incentives, job creation, whatever the case may be. Oh, absolutely. And I think even like across you know the wide spectrum of opinions uh, about big tech, I think that that is sort of recognized. So again, whether you're suspicious of uh, big tech from a more left or a more conservative point of view, I think broadly it's recognized what you need. Yeah, it's a set of stable rules that are uniform from one company to another. Yeah, and stable across time. You can't just be piecemeal threatening or throwing cash at these firms. But again, what it sort of comes back to, though, is the power of these firms. Like most companies couldn't get all of America's cities to debase themselves and beg for a second headquarters. But Amazon absolutely was able to do that. And it was quite a spectacle. And they ended up splitting the investment and walking away from New York. And then, of course, putting tens of thousands of jobs there anyway without millions of dollars in cash, which kind of shows – perhaps the uh, lack of necessity for these huge uh, uh, subsidy and incentive packages. But hopefully, with these new investigations we have coming down at the national level, and indeed the international level of these big tech firms, you know, we do have the FTC and the Justice Department here, and overseas, like the strongest regulation so far that any of these firms are subject to is all emanating from the European Union, from privacy to data storage to the right to be forgotten. It's interesting, and of course I talk about it in the book a bit, um, 
because the difference in these regulatory conditions. Plus, it does end up mattering that all of these big tech platform companies and their monopolies or semi-monopolies, they are all American. And uh, the European Union is used to being partially dominated by American firms, you know, from IBM to Coke. But they're a little more willing to regulate firms that are out of state, um, despite you know, re a real political presence that those firms have overseas, too. But I think a new rules-based approach is very reasonable, especially one that limits the power of these firms. Uh, again, we have a fairly long record now of all of these firms. Once network effects builds up their market power from Microsoft all the way to Google and Facebook, they aren't shy about using it to crush competitors and destroy rivals. I mentioned this in the book. There's just a piece of Wall Street re uh, Journal reporting about Facebook. And they didn't seem to be using this word ironically, but they mentioned that Facebook has a whole little division in the company whose job is to monitor startups you know, new small web-based firms that might potentially compete with Facebook or one of its other apps like Instagram or Messenger. And they try to buy up that firm at a very early stage when they can buy it for just a million bucks from some founder in their garage uh, or crush it or go after it legally in some other way. And the way the journal described it was Facebook is out to disrupt any potential challengers, which is kind of funny because, of course, all these firms talk about is how we're disruptors and we're breaking up that inefficient old economy now that they're the economy and the five biggest companies in the U.S. are all these tech platforms now, which is unheard of, they try to disrupt and you know put control over their upstarts and small competitors too. So I think rules that rein in these firms' power or even go further in putting the workforce more in charge or you know, and in that way potentially partially socializing the platforms, to me, those are the things we should look at, things that address the firm's market power. No question about that. Uh, we've been speaking with Rob Larson, who's a professor of economics. Uh, the uh, book is called Bit Tyrants, The Political Economy of Silicon Valley. We are linking to the book. Definitely check it out. Rob, always a pleasure having you on. Thanks, Dave. My pleasure. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. In today's disgusting but totally unsurprising news, Donald Trump allegedly referred to MSNBC reporter Katie Tours' transgender mom as a bitch with a tranny dad. Those are the president's alleged words, so I'm allowed to say them. This is from a new book called Sinking in the Swamp by Lachlan Markey and Asawin Subseng. Katie Tour is the daughter of Zoe Tour. You might remember Zoe Tour from the O.J. Simpson low speed helicopter car chase in that white Bronco in 1994. If you were around then, Zoe Tour doesn't like Trump and Zoe Tour is a trans woman. And the book alleges that Donald Trump makes horrible comments about women all the time. He called uh, Megan McCain, the daughter of the late Senator John McCain, dumber than her father, pointed out that she's been getting fatter after she said things on The View that Trump didn't like. This actually started with Trump getting into it with Katie Tour herself when he was running for president, writing off her questions sometimes during interviews when he didn't want to answer one of her questions. He would say, oh, give me a break. Next question, Katie. Very, very condescending. He started calling her little Katie started calling her a third rate journalist, all of that stuff. And once when she tried to follow up a question with Trump, he simply said, be quiet. Then, of course, we get to these latest allegations that Trump referred to Katie Tour privately as again, a bitch with a tranny dad referring to Katie Tour's transgender mom. This is the president. Now, he will have defenders no matter what he says. And lots of people probably agree with him. There's a lot of people in this country I don't know if it's, you know, 15 percent, 17 percent that are extremely anti trans. And while they probably would never be willing to say what Donald Trump is accused of saying, they aren't going to get too upset about hearing that Donald Trump said it. That's one group. There's also people who don't necessarily even agree with Trump attacking trans people, but they do generally want things to sort of go back to the way they imagine things were in the 1950s. And they see treating trans people respectfully 
as something that's not quite in line with their 1950s ideal. So they're not really going to get bent out of shape about attacking trans people, but they're not going to go and do it themselves. And then, of course, remember, First Lady Melania Trump's big initiative was going to be ending bullying, fighting bullying. And her husband is one of the biggest bullies of all sorts uh, uh, of different groups of people based on their identity that we know of. I wish it weren't the case, but too many people either like comments like these or they're just indifferent as long as Trump won't let Mexicans in the country, right? Or whatever their priority is. It's one of those areas where we just need to change the dialogue completely. A different president could do that. We talk about lots of the things that would take a long time to change. And Trump didn't create racism. Trump didn't create xenophobia or anti trans bias or anti Semitism. But when he says things like this, when he doesn't uh, do anything about the coalescing and growing uh, extremist movements, he makes the people who are into those ideologies emboldened and more comfortable publicly displaying their beliefs. If Trump leaves the White House in a year, um, that's not going to change the views of these extremists, but it might put them back at least in a little bit of a more hidden position in society where they might think twice about going public with these views. And then over time, hopefully those views will continue to dissipate or age out, as we like to say. We can hope. Imagine being Katie Tour and finding out that the president referred to a parent of yours in this way. It's almost inconceivable, or at least it would have been in 2015. But this is 2020 United States, and this story barely makes headlines in the midst of everything else that's going on. Really, really shocking stuff. An incredible thing happened yesterday, which is that the David Pakman Show YouTube channel reached an extraordinary milestone, 800,000 subscribers. That's an eight followed by five zeros. We have the video. It happened live on last night's uh, Iowa caucus stream. Let's take a look at the big moment. Buckle in, folks. We are very, very close here. We have reached 800,000 subscribers. Amazing. And I don't know why, but this has not updated. How lame is that? It seems to be broken. It's stuck at 799. Can you imagine? Oh, there it is. Amazing. Incredible. I hope someone records that. Please clip that. Please send it to me. I want to post that to my Instagram page or whatever. Please email me that. We did it. Yes, yeah, you can see a riveting and very, very exciting moment. But in all seriousness, thank you. Thank you to the 800 now getting close to 801,000 of you. Check out a graph of our subscribers uh, that I put together today. I have some interesting little factoids for you. We've been building the YouTube channel for a long time. I went back and looked our first month on YouTube. We had four subscribers. I don't mean that we gained four subscribers a day after our entire first month on YouTube. We had four subscribers. Our entire second year on YouTube, we gained 3,200 subscribers. An entire year, 3,200 subscribers. Just during yesterday's live stream of the Iowa caucuses, we gained about 600 subscribers in a three hour stream. And we reached this amazing milestone of 800,000. So thank you so much. The next goal, of course, is a million. We'll probably do something little for 900,000, but 1 million is really that nice round number. Now, this is funny. Weeks ago, I started looking at the numbers. We were in Jan, you know, first week of January, second week of January. I was looking at the numbers, I was looking at the calendar, and I was thinking we might be able to do 800,000 by my birthday, which was on Sunday, February 2nd. And as we were getting closer, we were 10 days away, we were five days away. I looked and still, February 2nd seemed viable and we missed it. But my calculation was only off by like 22 hours. The new goal is 1 million by election day. OK, 1 million by November 3rd, 2020. It is very hard to predict with much precision because so many factors can affect this right now on Social Blade, which tracks this data. It looks like we're on track to hit a million subscribers sometime between October 12 and December. So we might clear a million three weeks before the election. We might miss it by six weeks. It could end up getting pushed into 2021, depending on what happens. Now, as we close in, I will fine tune the numbers. But the goal, which would be so huge for the progressive movement to have another show enter this category in the millions, along with TYT, the Young Turks, 
it would be huge to do it before the 2020 election. I'll keep you posted. But as of right now, it's possible. It's possible. And thank you to the more than 800,000 of you that are currently subscribed to our YouTube channel. Really feels great to have uh, accomplished this. We have a voicemail number. The number is 2192 David P. This voicemail doesn't feel so good. Take a listen to what this person has to say. Hey David, you're a liberal hack and Trump 2020, Trump's going to win. Uh, nobody cares about you and your f-ing liberalness. The reality of the situation is you're just like Fox News, who you love to criticize just because they love Trump, but you love Bernie, so I don't see the difference. And I think you should be arrested for spreading false misinformation. And mm. honestly, if this was Soviet Russia, you'd have a bull in your f-ing head. Wow. Um, now, I, I do wonder false misinformation. Is that a do- double negative? Does that mean we're spreading just information, true information? Fa- misinformation would not be accurate if it's false misinformation. Maybe it is good and the person doesn't realize it. In any case, that's what we are fighting. Right. So as a reminder, you're not going to convince that person to vote for anybody other than Trump. So don't bother. Don't waste your time on it. And these uh, I, I play these voicemails for you. Number one, just to let you know about the level of vitriol that exists out there. But number two, because these are illustrations that we can't win. We it's not a viable strategy to say, let's all go out and convince people like that dude not to vote for Trump. It's not going to happen. The focus needs to be get out the vote, prevent voter suppression, prevent a toxic, destructive primary that will actually do damage to the opportunity to remove Donald Trump. That is the focus. Find the half of the country that doesn't vote and talk to the people who agree with us and make sure that they go out and vote because a conversation with that guy is a dead end. Might as well run a motorcycle directly into a brick wall. You're not going to get anything accomplished. The focus has to be a different one. We have a great bonus show for you today. We will talk about DNC members who are discussing possible rule changes at the convention to potentially deny Bernie Sanders the nomination if it were to come to it. Secondly, even um, insured adults who have health insurance are increasingly going to primary care less and less often because of the out of pocket costs. These are folks with insurance. We will talk about that. We will also talk about the news shocking in the media world that right wing radio host Rush Limbaugh says he has advanced lung cancer immediately will be missing uh, a lot of his show undergoing treatment. We will discuss that and much more on today's bonus show. Get access instantly by becoming a member at joinpacman.com or by becoming a patron at the $5 or greater level at patreon.com slash David Pacman show. The David Pacman show at davidpacman.com.